Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. My name is Corey Heights. I am the host and the founder of Prep Athletics. And joining me today, all the way from Kent or South Kent, Connecticut, is Coach Raphael Chilius. And he is also coached at the D1 level. He's coached at the University of Washington, Yukon, Villanova, and Eastern Carolina. East Carolina. Coach is a top college recruiter and has helped get his programs many players who have gone on to play at the NBA, which include Isaiah Thomas and Markel Fultz, just to name a few. And now after being in the college ranks, Coach is back at the prep school level. So Coach, welcome to the show. Thanks, Corey. I appreciate you having me on. So why come back to the prep school level after all those years at D1? Uh, You know, this is at the end of the day, when I was a college coach, I always said I coached with the high school coach's mindset. Once you've been a high school coach, um, you know, you always have uh, uh, you're always drawn uh, back to that level because you get to spend more time with the kids, et cetera. So and obviously this is kind of my baby uh, put put the South Kent um, prep program on the map the first time and. Uh, would love to see it get back to where it was. Now, how'd you do that? Initially, when you were there, I know you came there from West Nottingham. That was your first mm-hmm. spot, right? Mm-hmm. So you get to South Kent, and what was the process for you of getting those type of players you got in there? Well, actually, what happened was um, when I took the job here, basically, I thought none of the kids who were going to come to West Nottingham that, that the following year with me would follow me to a bo- all-boys school because West Nottingham was co-ed, all-boys school in Connecticut. And every every kid who was coming in asked, could they come? They followed me here. So we were really fortunate to, to start the whole thing off with um, Jack McClinton, Darrell Wright, who went straight from high school to the NBA, and Cheyenne Moore, and Gilbert Brown now, who's my associate head coach, was a freshman back then. So we started off with a great group, and it just built from there. Gotcha. Now tell us a little bit about, about your background. Where did you grow up, and, and, and why did you pick basketball as a sport? Yeah, I grew up in Maryland, and um, – just outside of Washington DC area. And, you know, the DMV is basketball central. And in my neighborhood, it's a tough neighborhood, um, all the best all the best basketball players were the best football players and vice versa. So you really didn't have a choice. And it was kind of the vehicle to have an opportunity to get out and maybe go to college. Um, my sister who's three years older than me was the first person in my neighborhood to ever go to college. And so that kind of inspired me and some other people in my age group that, hey, we can get out and have the ability to go to college, and basketball was the vehicle. Gotcha. So you played in college at Lafayette, right? Yeah. Okay, then why coach? What, what drew you to that? Well, you know, I joke around with people all the time, and from the time I was, like, five years old, every coach who coached me said, you should be a coach, and I thought they were being sarcastic, you know, saying maybe I talk too much or something, but I just could always kind of see the game better than I can play the game, and I was still a good player, a Division One basketball player, but I always had a, a sense of, seeing how the game worked and also being able to get my teammates to do sometimes things the coaches couldn't get them to do because just my feel and the way I communicated with guys and everything. So I think I was always on that path, even though I thought I was going to go uh, immediately into the corporate world, but coaching seemed to be it. Gotcha. And you have a history of just recruiting some monster players from, you know, you're saying that West Nottingham, you had Darrell Wright and then he followed you to South Kent, but What's your pitch? What do you have special that other guys don't have that's getting these kids into your programs? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm very um, honest with the players. I don't tell them what they want to hear. To get them, I tell them what they need to hear. And a lot of coaches are shy away from that because they think, man, if I tell a kid he can't do this or he's terrible on defense, they're not going to come play for me. And I think every good player, really good player who wants to be good, they want to hear the truth. Even if they don't like the truth and the people around them may not like the truth. And at the end of the day, I'm going to tell them the truth the entire time and always tell them, you know, I'm going to have a good team, whether you come or not. So I'm going to tell you the truth. And I only want guys who can receive the truth because they'll be able to take coaching. And obviously I think players appreciate when you've played the game, um, they know that you're just not saying it's speculating. We'll get to this. We talk about college basketball, right? Um, They're not just speculating how it's going to be. You've played. Um, And I think that that helps a lot too. So you've got a kid who's getting recruited by three schools and two of them are just saying everything positive and you come in and give them the, 
the reality of the situation we need to improve on. I'm guessing through years of experience, you've seen that that's actually worked. And, and does that mean that you're one of the few people doing it or just that with your connections or your personality? Like there has to be other coaches. Sometimes the push is over the top, you know. I know with Markel Fultz, for example, um, he, he said, man, because, you know, he got recruited by everyone. And it was like, they don't, they, not one person has told me anything bad about my game. Where I, if you go, I've gone to games of his and he scored like 25 or 30. And I said, man, you were awful. You know, this, this, that, boom, boom, boom. You know, you need to improve this, improve that. He goes, man, the other coaches just called me saying, man, you're the best thing basically since sliced bread. And I think that the best want truth tellers around them. Gotcha. Now, your first college job was where after South Kent? University of Washington. I was at Nike first and then University of Washington. Okay. What was your role at Nike? Um, I, I kind of ran a lot of the grassroots stuff, all the, the major uh, academies like the LeBron James Skills Academy, um, the Hoop Summit. I was a big part of the Hoop Summit. Mm. And then also the Jordan International, Brand International Camps, which was something I was really uh, deeply involved with, helping with the internationals, finding the international guys. For example, when I was there, uh, Ennis Cantor was a kid who we found at a camp in Greece and a lot of people didn't really know about him. And he was a kid we invited over to the Jordan Brand International game in Madison Square Garden and he just kind of blew up from there. So that was a big piece. Um, but I was really never, um, when I was here at South Kent, the first time I had all those really, really good players and I got offered college jobs all the time. And I always said to the college coaches, I said, well, offer me a job when I don't have a player that you like. Mm. Because that's gonna tell me that you, uh, you respect me and, and see me as a coach, not just as a person who's a conduit to help you get really good players. Obviously that's part of it, but you know, again, I view myself until the day I die as a good old high school coach, you know, that I coach the game. I know X's and O's, you know, that's the biggest part of me, even though externally people always say, man, he's a great recruiter. And so I would only went, I would only go work for someone when I didn't have a player for him. And so going from Nike to Washington, Lorenzo and I, knew each other from my system with the law school at Pepperdine when he first coached at Pepperdine. And we knew each other from back then. He knew that was always my thing. And so he called me when I didn't have a player. You know, he called me and said, no, I, I want you to come and be a coach with me. Gotcha. And when you joined the college ranks, you went, you went to Power Five immediately. What was the big difference you noticed that you did not, you weren't expecting going in? Um, I think the, the, the level of talent obviously was similar to what I had here but the level of talent who really weren't prepared to play at that level kind of shocked me. Mm. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of high school programs and people, again, when you get really good players, they may not coach them as hard or as detailed as you need to because those kids get away with a lot of things. And so the level of, and Lorenzo was great with it, you know, taking guys who are really, really talented, but really hadn't learned proper footwork and shooting technique and that thing and getting them to buy in and learn all that stuff in order to help them get to the next level as a player. I was that, that was the thing that caught me off guard at first. Like, man, these kids are really talented, but some of these guys might not have gotten my game at, at South Kent early because they didn't know the fundamentals. And that's where you probably use that in your pitch to tell kids, hey, this is where post-grad year will benefit you because this extra year under me, you'll get to shore up a lot of this stuff that maybe your cohorts coming straight out of high school don't have shored up yet. Right, and especially now, right, being back, that I'm not speculating, right? I'm telling them because I was at that level and I know what the college coaches mm -hmm. are. And the first thing I tell all the players that defensively, you have to know everything. The, th the terminology may be different when you go somewhere else, go to college, but you have to know these boom, 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 these principles because that's what's going to get a freshman on the court. Not because you can really score. And I give an example, go back and look at his Washington. We had Terrence Ross. As a freshman, there were games where he didn't play didn't play very much and had zero to do with his ability to score. He could score 40 points anytime he wanted to. Um, it was teaching him, no, this is sound defense, this is the, the terminology, where to be on the floor defensively. And um, being back here, that's what I tell the kids, I say, hey, you know, it's kind of like, uh, and I don't care if people, you can use this in their own recruiting of kids. It's like, you know, what's your favorite, Tori, what's your favorite dessert? Do you like dessert? Key lime pie. Okay, who makes it? Who makes your favorite key lime pie? Uh, a supermarket down in Florida. <laughs> okay. So that supermarket down in Florida, the people who make it, do you think they know the ingredients that go in that key lime pie? Absolutely. They don't speculate what goes into it, right? And I tell the same kids, I said, you know, I've been at the level where you want to go to. It's not speculation. I know all the ingredients that's going to get you there. And you can either take a chance over here 
where nothing against that other program because there are a lot of great coaches, a lot of great programs in this country. But when I tell you this was going to happen, this was going to happen, I know because I was there. Yeah, oh, that's great. That's a great pitch. Now, you went from there to then UConn, UConn and Villanova were next. I don't know. Which order was that? Villanova, then back to Washington and UConn. So you were in a program in Villanova with Jay Wright, who shortly after you left won the national title with Chris Jenkins, who were, that's kind of how we're connected. Um, tell me some differences and what you picked up being on that staff. Um, well, the, the big thing with Jay – I would say, and, and not the other coaches don't do it, but the, the level to the degree in which he does it, because he's the same. Remember, he started off, he was a D3 um, graduate assistant for Van Gundy, for the older Van Gundy. And so when you go to work for Jay and the kids go to practice there, it's like going to basketball camp every day. Like it's the fundamentals are broken down to the nth degree every single day at the highest level of basketball, because he really puts an emphasis on you know, you can have great talent, but if you don't play the right way, it doesn't help the team win. And and so the level of detail, um, the level of expectation of guys playing the way that he expects them to play um, was uh, just tremendous. And every coach has their their own thing that they're great at. But I think that in terms of him, uh, it was like going to basketball camp. Like I felt like I was a kid again at camp every day. You know, and I'm a coach and I I, you know, you know, basketball, right. But I just felt like every day I was going to basketball camp. Yeah. And then how about UConn? What was it like there? Um, the, the, the first thing is you walk in the building and you see all those jerseys and banners hanging up on both sides of the facility, the women and the men, you just know that basketball is, it's a serious thing here. Mm -hmm. Um, and then obviously working with Kevin now I got even more detailed in terms, of, especially on the defensive side of the ball, the, the highest level, the NBA level, like, you know, we play boxes and elbows here, you know, and that concept is not um, a great concept. A lot, a lot of people not using college basketball, but, you know, this past year coming back, we averaged 81 points a game, but it was because of how we play defense. Teams had a really hard time cracking our defensive schemes. And so Kevin was really greatly uh, on that end of the court detail oriented and then offensively just the ability to be able to, out of timeouts, ATOs, what they call them. I thought he had, uh, uh, you know, probably a stack of ATOs like this in his brain that we run that teams would never see. You know, it's a lot like NBA game. You watch, they're all running the same stuff, basically, right? The separators are the ATOs and their sideline out of bounds plays mm. in the NBA. And so that really got me to hone in on that part of the game even greater. And do you incorporate that now with your team at South Kent? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, every game, I mean, people who play us, they're going to see something that they've never seen on film if they scout us every single game. Um, and it's things um, look similar, but they're just one little tweak or two that's different that really uh, throws other teams off. Yeah. And then after that, then you went to Eastern Carolina or East Carolina. East Carolina I'm saying yeah. that. And yeah. you had a top 10 recruiting class there. And that's not a school that's known nationwide for basketball. So tell me, what, what was the pitch to come to Eastern or East Carolina? Well, Joe and I, had obviously, at the levels I coached as an assistant coach when he was at Kansas, you know, we had coached, we recruit, we'd be in the gym a lot together, recruit, trying to recruit the same type of guys. And so we kind of had the same kind of vision of what's a really good player. And it's because it just wasn't me. I think our entire staff there uh, made a real, real effort to make sure we upgraded um, how, how players are evaluated, you know, and sometimes the places that aren't the Villanovas of the world, eva being able to evaluate is greater than um, other places. You got to be able to evaluate and see, okay, well, this kid, um, if he's that good right away, right now, Duke's going to get him in the state of North Carolina or Carolina's going to get him, right? But we have a kid who's a titch under there and you can see, but once they get into college and get in the system, get coached, they're going to be just as effective as a college basketball player as some of these five-star guys. So that's what we really, really made a concerted effort to go after guys who were kind of under the radar or on the radar, but we had relationships with or new people. Who knew the gotcha. kid? Yeah. Gotcha. So now you've gone South Kent, done all these great stops, gotten all this knowledge in the college ranks, and now you're back at South Kent again. Mm -hmm. What's the big thing now you're doing different this time around um, that you didn't do before? Is, I'm glad you asked because, uh, you know, Darrell Wright and Isaiah and those guys asked me, what would you do different? And I said, the first time I was here, we had all the best players, you know, mm -hmm. and but sometimes having all the best players don't make the best teams. Um, one of our best teams I had here, the first stint, you know, we had an NBA player straight out of NBA. And then 
nine or 10 high division one kids, but my starting point guard was a division three point guard. And that was our best team because he understood his role and understood when you go, when you get off the bus and you go to the um, all you can eat uh, dine at buffet that the big guys eat first, you know, and point guard, you eat last. And that's a concept, right? Being a good, a great teammate, being a great leader. And so my deal when I came back was, I'm gonna get good players, but we're gonna have the best team possibly because all the pieces fit. Sometimes you get all the play, best players, the pieces don't fit. Right. And that's something I really learned at the, at, the college, at the college level is that you can have all the best players, but the pieces don't fit, you're not gonna win games. And, and then the biggest piece for me, and it was here the first time was reestablishing our culture and the culture, not just in the gym, but across campus that we were gonna have, you know, guys who took school seriously, who are gonna to go to chapel when it's supposed to be a chapel. They're gonna be early places. They're gonna be got great citizens in the community. And then our, our deal is being, being the toughest minded team out there possible when we get to the gym. And I'm, I'm proud to say this first group we had reestablished our culture because the team actually won an award that goes to usually one student every year on campus. Mm. And that, that award is called the Abbott Award. And that's given to the student who best exemplifies all the principles and values of the entire school. Our team won the award because they couldn't decide. So many guys on our team upheld those standards. They couldn't pick just one to win it. And so they chose the whole team. Oh, that's great. That's an honor. That's an honor yeah. what you've done there. Give us a little bit of a sales pitch, not just on the, the program, but actually South Kent itself. Like, tell us a little bit about the school, the culture, the academics, location, history, just the basics. I would say this school is founded on basically that um, principle of self-reliance, toughness. It's an all boys school. And so it's that niche of getting the right um, boys on campus and helping them grow into men where they don't have the distractions that they would have at a co-ed school. Um, when they also, one of the tenants here is just being a great person, being a great person in the community and being selfless and volunteering and community service and, and you name it. So I think when a, 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 a young man chooses to come to school here, they literally are getting the whole deal to their well-rounded person. So my pitch to them is I'm not recruiting you and coaching you for this one year or four years, however long you're going to be here. We want to help you become the best person, the best student athlete you can be for the next 70 years of your life because you're going to live longer than you play basketball, hopefully. Um, and so there's a really concerted effort on making sure that we recruit kids with character, not characters. And if you happen to a character shows up here, you help him and you work with him to learn how to be have great character. Yeah, that makes sense. And All academically, right. you know, we take a wide range of students, but, you know, um, now South Kent's a place where we're kind of unique. We offer something called super classes, which we have professors who are certified adjunct professors through Syracuse. And so at Syracuse, there would be these 12 week classes where here we're in quarter to eight weeks. So they're even more intense and they're college credit classes and business and mathematics and that type of thing. And so it's helped us draw students who, you know, my starting point guard is going to Cornell uh, this year. So we have a, a wide range. So we have the Cornells of the world and we have kids, if they come in here younger as a ninth and 10th grader who've struggled a little bit, that they get here and they get the one-on-one, uh, -on -one, the small classrooms, the uh, study sessions at night where your teacher is actually here to help you at night to get better and fill in some holes. So we take a wide range. So it creates a, a campus that has kids who have a wide range of differences in the classroom and in their sport. You know, we're really lucky, really good soccer. And so everyone here is chasing a carrot. And what we do a good job of is finding out what your carrot is. And I say to, I just had a, um, a student visit here on Friday and said, you know, I find out what you're chasing and I chase you to, so you get to it. I chase you. I don't say, oh yeah, here it is. Now I'm gonna chase you and make sure, once you tell me what your goal is, I'm gonna chase you every day to make sure you're doing everything to chase that goal. Mm, that's great, that's great. Um, with those college credits, and this is, you know, a lot of prep schools offer different college options, but they don't always translate to right. the school you end up going to. What can you, what can you tell families about that? Say I, I spend the year getting college credits. 90, 95% of the colleges in, in, in America take these credits. Perfect. Okay. You know, not, you know, the AP classes are great, right? But as you said, sometimes AP classes don't translate because the student now has to pat, get a certain score on the AP test. And then they have to choose the college who's actually going to take that that score and the test to get those credits where 
these are college credits, they're your credits. And the vast majority, I mean, maybe MIT or RIT doesn't take some of the classes, right? But the vast majority of the colleges you're gonna to go to are gonna take these credits. And that's that's a really a great draw. And it's not just for postgraduates, it's for just if you're a strong student, whether you're 11th grade or 12th grade, um, you have an opportunity to take these classes. For instance, I have a returning player who's a young senior this year, he's already up through calculus two in college. Mm. And so now we're challenged, we're trying to find like a linear algebra class or something because he wants to be an engineer. And so we do a great job of finding out what your carrot is and try to challenge you to get there. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. That's great. Hey, here's a new fun fact uh, or a fun uh, segment we do on the show called Famous Alums of mm -hmm. the uh, school we're talking to right now. And uh, we got a couple of basketball ones here. Isaiah Thomas, Andre Blatch, Darrell Wright. Um, here's a couple of other random ones. Chip Monk. Do you know who that is? Yeah, absolutely. Tell everyone I, who Chip I, Monk I, is. I don't know Chip Monk well, but how do you know? I've heard the name around here for sure. Wikipedia, baby. Wikipedia, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a long time ago. I mean, they're, you know, because of the school is such a niche school, a lot of the, the more, more famous people you're going to hear have been student athletes, you mm -hmm. know, right now we have, um, I think we had a couple uh, hockey players who were up for the Hobie Baker Award, you know, we had two last year, were on the NHL team that won the, the championship, you know, uh, two of our soccer players, Marshall just won the national championship. So they're on that team. So a lot of them you're going to hear, you know, will be um, more athletes than than everything else. But we've had a lot of good famous alums here. Yeah, I got two non-athletes here. So Chip Monk, for those of you who don't know, which I didn't know until my my crack research team got it to me, uh, was the announcer at Woodstock. So yes. if you're listening to Woodstock uh, live album, you're going to hear Chip on there saying, yeah. don't eat the uh, brown acid. And fact, um, Dr. Garcia, you know, who you know, our admissions director, he was just telling me about Chip Monk about a month ago. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. And then next is a Bang Bang. Do you know who Bang Bang is? I don't know Bang Bang. Okay, Keith Bang Bang McGurdy is a famous tattoo artist. Mm -hmm. And he has tattooed uh, such celebrities as Rihanna, Katy Perry, Miley Cyrus, and LeBron James. That's awesome. Yeah, so that's your fun fact of the day, and you can take yeah, that well, with it. Yeah, you know, all the kids want tattoos, and I have tattoos, so I might have to reach out and get Bang Bang. I might not be able to afford them, though. I need Bang Bang to uh, fix my terrible 19-year-old <laughs> decision tattoos I've got, so... <laughs> I might need you to connect me. <laughs> yeah, hey, that you could use any recruiting pitch now too. Hey, bang bang, I'll tat you up. If, uh, I'll see tattoos, we'll we'll bring bang bang in one weekend. There you go. <laughs> um, COVID. So during COVID, how did that affect your placement of your kids? Uh -huh. uh, just like the vast majority of high schools and prep schools around the country, it made it um, quite a challenge um, because obviously college coaches weren't seeing them in person. Fortunately for me, because of my background. I've had so many really good players and my ability to evaluate, um, cause I will back up a, a, a lot of the players I recruited weren't top 50, top 100 kids in the country. But I looked at them and said, Hey, if they're in our system, especially when we're at Washington, I know that we, and they're going to work really hard. They could become pros. Um, and same thing here, uh, like in West Nottingham, my first, when I had Josh Boone, mm -hmm. you know, he was a 16 year old high school graduate. He was an unbelievable student. Uh, 13 something on his SAT. Um, he had LaSalle and St. Joe's was only two division one offers. And I had a big trial at my gym uh, there for the next group of guys to come in. And there were some guys who made the NBA and they were going to be in high school. I passed on them and I took Josh Boone and people thought I was crazy. And I was like, I'm just telling you, he's six foot 10. He has zero hair on his face. He runs and jumps like a deer. He's super smart. I'm telling you, he's an NBA player. And that year, his final five, I think, ended up being Georgetown, Stanford, Kansas, North Carolina, and Yukon. And obviously, he went, went on and became a pro after three years. Um, so I would say, um, so coaches know I know how to evaluate. And he, there's plenty more, like Jack McClinton, his jersey's in the Hall of Fame at University of Miami now. You know, he got drafted by the Spurs in the second round, coming out of University of Miami. And I think he's either one or two in all time three point percentage and free throw percentage at the University of Miami. His high school coach told me he was a Division three mm -hmm. basketball player when I recruited him. So I'll say all to say that coaches know if, if I'm saying a kid can play for you, there's a pretty good chance that he can. And they trust my word and they maybe look at kids more so over and over and over than they would if someone else who they didn't know or someone who had their first Division one player on their program. And so, but that being said, I still spent lots of nights um, in my office up to two or three in the morning, calling West Coast, you name it, to help our kids get placed. 
And, you know, our, our guys got placed, but it was a real challenge. It, it was a real challenge. And I, I, I give uh, applaud the kids who were here this past year who were at other places who kept tapping at the stone, getting up every day, giving all the coaches around the country and myself the best effort they could um, to put themselves in a position to still be able to go to college. And, you know, a couple of guys had to go a level lower than what they probably would have had to go because of COVID. But my thing is, at the end of the day, when I brought you here, it wasn't about you being able to go to the best places in the country, but go to the best places that you can play at. What's the best fit for you? And like when I was in college, I want you, to, when I was a college assistant, I said, I want you to choose us. If you would come here, if you broke your back and you couldn't play basketball anymore, this is still the school. This is still the community. This is still the location. These are still the people you want to be around if your basketball was taken away from you for, for, for some reason. And, and that's how it was here. You know, that's how I want kids to make their choices. Walk yourself into the choice that's going to be the best for you if things don't turn out the way you would like them to and you, you don't want your name to be in the transfer portal. You would still want to go to school there even if basketball was taken away. Right. That's great. Now, with COVID going on, has that changed how you've recruited kids for this next year's team? Well, it's still business as usual. Early before I, you know, I was choosing, I was watching a lot of film, um, but I've been able to get out um, places um, that have opened up again and, you know, with the COVID uh, protocols in place and I've been able to see, see players in person myself. Again, um, again, the, the basketball piece for me is easy in choosing someone. It is the, the what I've been able to do still is when people tell me, that, yeah, this, they're this kind of teammate. They're a great teammate. I'm going to games. I'm watching that. I'm not watching if they can play or not. I'm not going to go watch them if I didn't think they could play. I'm, I'm watching all the other stuff. Are they going to be a teammate? Are they going to allow me to coach them? Are the people around them who I'm watching in the stands, are they going to allow me to coach them? Or are they going to coach them? You know, I'm watching all that stuff. I think that's one of those soft skills. Kids just need to have beaten their heads over and over again that it's not about how many points you score. I really think that's 90% of that they think they think what that's what does it when everyone else knows experts like yourself that it's all the other soft skills too that come into place and that that passionate parent in the crowd can really be a hindrance too sometimes that bad body yeah. language that going to the end of the bench and not clapping for your teammates not listening in the huddle all that right. stuff is just important to guys like you well think about it Corey you you know these schools up here you know this league you know and the teams I play against this will be the first time a guy's gonna sit on the bench too some Mm -hmm. You know, you have guys in, in a normal high school game who are playing like, you know, I guess regular high school plays 36 minutes. We play 40, play college level games. Right. And they're used to playing all the minutes or getting all the shots, shooting all the balls, I say. So you used to shooting all the balls. This is the first time you got to come maybe and learn how to be a really good teammate. Unless they're down in the WCAC, right, where, yeah. you know, it's the same type of type of environment that um, not this. The, I would say this isn't the place for everyone. Our league isn't the place for everyone because if you don't have selflessness in your bones somewhere and that some people have to learn it, um, it's going to be tough for you because there are going to be times where and I'm drawing up an ATO and it's not for you and you're the best player, but it's not for you because you're not playing well or you've missed your last five threes. Does it make sense for us to run that for you or run it to somebody who's going to make a shot because we're trying to win? And that's the biggest part about, um, I think, when you come to places like this is that you have the ability to teach kids how to win because the, the two of the hardest things at the college level to teach and, and goes from there to the NBA is one, teaching players how to play really, really hard. And the other thing is how to win. Mm. When I go and watch a lot of the high school ki kids that I recruit in AAU, I'm looking for kids who know how to win because I'm gonna teach you the rest. I'm gonna get your skills right. But do you wanna win or do you wanna just see your name? And that's, that's the biggest deal. And, and, and on, on the front and the back of the jerseys, your name's not going to be on there when you're here. It's about the team. Yeah. You know, an interesting thing I heard recently uh, was at Lone Peak. Remember that school out in Utah? Yeah. Just killed it the past couple of years, and, or past 10 years. And one thing they do is their coach, during, during open gym scrimmages, he keeps track of every day the teams are different, but he keeps track individually of how many kids win and lose in these meaningless open gym games and that tells him right there who the winners are and have absolutely. you ever heard of that being tracked before oh yeah absolutely i mean a lot of college teams do that you know we have you know if, tell guys to play one-on-one -on -one during the summer 
but keep a one-on-one -on -one board, mm. you know, challenge each other. Who won yesterday? Who won that? And then, like, and then when you play pickup, like I'm, I'm, uh, what you call it, uh, obsessive about it, you know, in our drills, who won the drill, you know, in our sprints, you may not be the fastest. I've had kids, um, at Villanova when Arch was there, Ryan Archie Diacono, he wasn't the fastest in the NBA. He's not the fastest guy, but I can't tell you how many times that I couldn't, I don't think I could put him five fingers up and say he came less than third in the sprint and he wasn't the fastest. It's all the mentality. Like, are you going to fight? Are you going to do that? And so those drills and watching guys and see, does it hurt a guy when you have a shooting contest and he doesn't win? Mm. You know, even if it's a non-shooter, you know, does, does it really bother him that he doesn't win? And those are the type of guys you watch and say, man, you know what? That's a guy who can go and be the 13th guy, the 13th scholarship at, at your college, because even if he doesn't get in, if he doesn't play, he's going to fight tooth and nail every day and make the guys in front of him better. And he's not going to complain, even though he wants to play, you know, he's not going to leave because he didn't play. Right. How about this? During COVID, have you changed any coaching uh, techniques you've had, or have you done anything outside the box you've not done before? Well, definitely early on uh, with our protocols, you know, because we were really small groups for a while, and then you have masks. Um, what it really helped me in terms of rotations, getting guys, because our big thing is playing fast on both ends of the court and playing really, really hard. If you're playing really, really, really hard, even at the highest level, most players can't play more than three and a half, four minutes at a time. Mm -hmm. It just can't. And COVID even made that even more so, playing with a mask on and playing as hard as you can you know, even in practice, I had to give more water breaks quicker than I normally would and getting guys out of even in practice and drills or when playing five on five, getting them off the court and getting them the proper rest and drink uh, much quicker than possible. So I found out you can get guys in really, really good shape much faster. And the thing is to sell the players. Yeah, you're coming out quicker, but you're getting back in quicker. Mm -hmm. The quicker you can get back in the game. And that's how I was able to play more even play even more guys than you normally wouldn't play in a game because you just couldn't you just, guys couldn't be out there and be effective for very long gotcha that's great that's great um behind you for those that can't see that are listening to this you have nba jerseys of former players how many players have you coached that are in the nba or have played in the NBA? Uh, now the number is with this past year 19 okay I've personally either coached or recruited okay now, I've asked this of a lot of guys uh, in the prep school world that have coached NBA guys, what separates these guys from just the players that don't make the NBA? And what, in your experience, is that it factor they have? The it factor, it, it, it's, it's several. Um, they have to have, I call it, they have to have a sickness. You know, you have to have a sickness to make it to the highest level. And that, what I'm saying when I talked about Jack McClinton and the Isaiah Thomas of the world, they do beyond what's required, you know? They're going to be early, they're going to stay late, but then they're going to go and when everyone else is sleeping, they're up at five in the morning, doing something to make themselves a better player. You know, or at night, you know, they're asking me to send them footage from practice, not to see themselves doing great things, but to make themselves better. You know, you have to have a sickness about this thing. You know, it's the same thing, Alexander Graham Bell, before the telephone was invented, failed 9,999 times. He had a sickness about that invention. And that's what our guys, you have to have a sickness. If you don't have a sickness, it's hard to be here. Um, secondly, I tell no matter where you are, you have to do at least one thing better than anyone else in the world at that time to make it to the NBA. You know, you're going to be the best shooter. You're going to be the best defender because most guys get drafted out of the top five or 10. You are going to be a role player in the NBA when you first get there. There's a guy who jumps off the screen, you know, it was a late sec Isaiah, number 60, right? But he comes in and he knows he has that sickness and he does some things better than anyone. He could score, really score the ball, no matter who's out there. Um, but you have to find one thing in your game for sure. You have to be able to do a lot of things, but you have to be able to do something better than anyone else in your draft class, something better than anyone else um, on your G League team, something better than anyone else on your European team that's going to give you a chance to get one of those 450 spots. Um, there's not a lot of spots, you know, and there's a lot of players trying to get them. So you really find out, and as a coach, you know, I think, um, you know, we grew up, man, you gotta make their strength their weakness. You gotta make their strength their weakness their strength their strength. No, you have to get their weakness up to par, but their strength needs to be their strength. 
like, and people get, get it sideways sometimes, you start working on everything else and you forget what makes them their strength their strength. You know, um, so it's a, it's a, you have to have the ability to, to help kids when they find out what that thing is, to make them the best at it while helping them to get good at everything else. But you have to, there's, a, there's always a separator that makes a team take you more than someone else. And a lot of times it has to do with something 20, the other 22 hours of the day when, they, when they're not at practice. Can they trust you? Will you be on time? Will you be early? Are you gonna bring other guys with you to help them be better? And I, I back up Corey, I'm sorry, taking too much time, but one of the other things I do with kids when I'm recruiting them, I talk to them about other good players. I ask them about them. And I, what I'm doing, I'm listening to see if they're able to compliment other people who are good. Mm. And I've been on calls with some big time players. And the first thing they do is trash every guy you ask. I literally have gotten off the phone and walked to my coach's office and said, we don't want him. Um, no matter how good he is, we don't want him here. Because if you can't compliment someone else, that means you're selfish. And you don't want selfish players in your program. That's the that's easy way to eat your program in, in, uh, inside out from the core when you bring a bunch of people in who can't compliment others. That is great. I've never heard that before, but that's a great, great strategy. Mm. Mm. Learn a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's make you, uh, let's talk a little bit NCA right now and the transfer rule. What are your thoughts on, on what's taking place right now? Man, you know what? The NCAA, they're getting up to speed because for so long, all the coaches said, man, why, why are the rules different? for football and basketball than the other sports, you know, for the kids, you know, they can move and play right away in other sports. At the same time, um, I think it's making access, which is one thing you want every kid to have, much harder. And for me, uh, being from someone from the uh, underrepresented, you know, on college campuses to begin with, that category, that demographic of people, people of color, I think inadvertently it's making access harder. For, for kids who otherwise wouldn't be able to go to college. Um, it's making it harder because there's a bottleneck. College coach is gonna take a, a kid maybe from one of the top five programs in the country who didn't play any minutes before they take a high school kid because they know they've been through the process. They've been in the weight room. They've been through a college practices for a year and they played against the best guys. And so college guys are gonna be more drawn to those or to people who come from programs like this and other programs similar to ours. And so to me, the low major kid or the kid who's a D2 kid, because even D2s and D3s now are sitting back and waiting because they know who's in the portal who can't play at those levels. And they're sitting back waiting and saying, we about to get ourselves a guy that we normally wouldn't get. Um, so now it just makes, I, I don't like barrier to entry um, in anything, whether it's in corporate, uh, sports or whatever, and anything to create inadvertently or intensely creates barriers to entry is, is difficult for me to wrap my head around, you know? And so some of the portal thing is I'm looking at barriers to entry for all students, not just students of color, but even, even more so the vast majority of the 70% of guys now who can get scholarships in basketball, the vast majority of those guys look like me and there's a barrier to entry. Yeah. But you being in the other side, being a college coach, are you going to take a chance on an 18 year old, never run away from mom and dad before, never played the grind of a college level, or are you going to take the eighth guy on a power five team? Like you've been in those yeah. conversations. So I, you kind of get it though, right? I do, I do get it. And it's hard. You know, I'd love to be, for me, I'd love to be in one of those situations where you, you don't have to win now because the, the, the university is used to you winning 25, 30 games, or you, maybe you're at a place where they value, or you're graduating all your kids, you know, and winning. Um, I think it's a fine line. I think you can't, I'm not the proponent that, man, take all high school guys or take all transfers. I think you can find a good mix. You know, the best programs I think are going to find a good mix where maybe, they, maybe they're taking mainly older guys and they're going to find a high school kid that they've sat down and talked to and say, look, if you don't play your first year, if you're a red shirt, don't leave because it's going to benefit you because you're going to learn all that. And so bring them along. Um, but I think those, I think those situations are going to be um, less and less um, um, uh, occurring. I think, I think you're going to get more so that you're going to have a lot of good high school kids who could play low major, mid major, division one, who may not be able to get there their first year out of high school, which could benefit, you know, prep school programs um, because now you get a post-grad 
and the schools who recruited him already know what they can do, but didn't have a spot for him this past year. But now they may be able to sign him in November, knowing they're going to have him coming in. Yeah, and I've got a couple of thoughts on that. One is the problem is there's a lot of kids that could go to college this year that that just don't have a spot, so they're going to look post-grad. But as you know, rosters like yours and your cohorts up in New England are almost full, if not full already. So there's less safe, legit spots available this late in the game. Right? I agree. So that's what- and as you know, as being someone who, who works with everyone, the other issue is the amount of financial aid that's available for a kid, right? People don't understand. They think these, you know, the legitimate prep school, prep schools up here, um, it's, a fi- it's financial aid based. Um, and early on, the earlier you get in, the more money is available. But the, the later you get in, you know, you and I have talked, I'll be very candid. There have been some kids that I've liked that you've put my way that I said, man, if he could pay this much more, I'd be happy to take him. Um, but, you know, that, that's an issue too. And again, you're creating barriers to entry. Now, even now, you're going to get, now junior college is going to benefit as well because they're going to get a lot of really good players, but then they're not going to be able to take some of the kids they normally would have taken. So it's such a trickle down effect that, um, I think this first two, three years, four years of the of the portal process, because it's not going to go away. You know, it, it it's here. That's it's that simple. And people are going to have to know how to navigate it and manage it. Yeah, my fear: a lot of these kids are going to just they've waited too last minute, or they just don't have good guidance, and they're going to end up right. at these pop up places that just aren't going to be safe. There might be fifty right. kids, and you know, my big question is, you know, a lot of teams now are. are are starting second teams, right? A lot of these pop-up academies are, are coming out of nowhere, right? Mm-hmm. And they're going to fill their ranks. That's no problem. But my big question is that families have to ask is, how are these places going to place my kids? There's right. a, like you just said, there's only so many college spots. Right. Um, so our colleges, our, our D3 teams now all going to have 24 kids in a roster. Our D1 program is now going to start JV programs for kids that want to pay a little bit. Right. I don't know. But you know what I think is that this time next year, we're gonna have a lot of programs, Jill, that that are doing the transfer thing for the first time mm-hmm. and don't like it. Right. They're not gonna like that culture that comes in, like, golly, we just had these mercenaries come in for one year. Let's go back to, to you about what was the first thing I said I did come back here. What was I focused on? The culture. Yeah. Right? I didn't say the players, I didn't say winning games. That happened as a result of the culture, right? And I was one of the first, when I came here the first time in 2003, especially up here in New England, it was mainly all the teams were all post-grads, right? And after that first year, we were really good. But then something, Amy said, man, I have to take some young kids, mm-hmm. you know, because um, you have to, once you establish a culture, if you're bringing in all new kids every year, what you have is a team. You don't have a culture. And for me here, I try to always have a couple of younger guys coming through the pipeline because as they get older, especially, they're going to say, well, guys, you know, the firm, but players don't lie to players. Coaches and recruit people lie to players about what's going to be like or fudge stuff to players. Players going to say, no, if, if you're one second late for chapel on game day, Coach Tillis is not playing you. You would not dress, all that type of stuff. But they don't know that if they're just hearing it from the coach. So come, some, like I had a kid a long time ago, I'm not going to say his name. And I told him how serious I was about acad- academics. You know, I went to Lafayette and um, I said, I'll be more upset with you. You don't do something in the classroom. And he didn't do something. I didn't play him at all for like a month until he realized it. And then he left and went somewhere who would play him and thought he was just going to get grades. And that's not how I roll. Yeah. Um, so like the schools up here, if, for example, a lot of us do have a second team or development team. Ours is a development team. But now our development teams up here are much better. And now I can say a lot of those kids are going to be like NESCAC, you know, Division Two guys. Um, and the coaches up here are used to working with schools and we'll work really, really hard to make sure those kids get placed too. What I'll never want to do is to have a kid here and take his money just because he can pay to come to school and have no, but I will say, hey, the parents, but I say it in the front before they come. I don't even project him as a division three player. Maybe he'll become one, but I'll help him every way. He's going to learn on that basketball court and our program, how to be a successful student in college you know, a successful student when he gets out of college and he gets a job on Wall Street. You know, that type, that that's learning at gym. That hard work, learn how to empty your bucket, not being afraid of the guy across from you, That that's learning at gym also. So it's going to be a lot, of, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, at, at the same time next year, we're going to see a lot of stuff completely different. And now we're seeing a lot different than we saw in August of last year, right? We're seeing right. how this this transfer thing just, just really turned everything upside down. You know, I heard last night, kids. I was on Zoom last night, 
there's actually almost 1200 females in the transfer portal. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I would see that, you know, because right. um, you know, a lot of the top female, you know, not generalized, but historically women's basketball players have um, embraced the academic component of the school they choose to go to much stronger than some of the male, the male counterparts. But you're seeing, you're seeing all that movement there. You know, I think it's, it's just culturally, um, we haven't taught kids how to fight. Yeah. We haven't, we just haven't taught them how to fight. Now you're king for a day of the NCAA. What changes do you make based on all you know right now? Well, right now I think there's so many changes going on. I wouldn't want to do any to start off just because um, I think when you, it's like being a, a jack of all trades, master of none, you know, dig in. I think the biggest thing is figuring out this NIL thing. That's the biggest thing, you know, how, how these kids are going to be compensated, how it works. And are, are, are there people who explain in tax implications to kids? Like, you know, you know, to do an NBA, a lot of players don't realize that they get there. Every state they play in besides Texas and Florida, the places that don't have in Oregon, don't have state income tax, you're getting taxed on that money. And when you go to Toronto, you're getting taxed even more. Yeah. There's PST, there's GST. That's all that stuff that people don't know. And I think they really got to dig in and get all the nuances so people understand, yeah, you're going to make some money, but you better be ready to pay taxes, you know? And right now, have they figured out, are there taxes, are there scholarships taxable income? Are scholarships taxable income? Because that's, that's, that's money. So it's a whole bunch of things I would, I would sit and dig in on initiatives that we have changed to make sure that everyone, it doesn't just benefit the players, it doesn't just benefit the NCAA, but everyone has a great understanding of all these changes. And guess what? If there are tax implications, guess what? Oregon is going to use that in recruiting, the Texas schools and the Florida schools. Absolutely. Why wouldn't you? Come mm -hmm. here. You're going to be able to make your money. It's going to be income tax wise, state income tax. You know, you still have to pay your federal, you yeah. know. But state income tax wise, you, you actually end up getting more money and to keep, to keep more money on the front end because it's not taxed. It's not taxable. Yeah, I guarantee you whenever like the Heat, the Magic, uh, the Mavs, the Spurs, Rockets, whenever they do their pitches, the Blazers to big time players like your LeBrons, I guarantee you that's a slide in their presentation. Like, hey, if you play here, you're going to get an extra seven million a year that's not going to the States. Absolutely. Imagine what you can do with that. Now, mind you, there's obviously other factors, but I guarantee you Mark Cuban's pitching that. Right. I mean, you would be, you would be, um, you'd be remiss if you didn't do that, you know? Yeah. Let's go through a couple quick hitters here at the end. What's the biggest win of your career, whether college or prep school? Um, I had a student who arrived here my first time that we didn't know, um, basically couldn't read and write. He came from another place and they said he was good academically, he might chase him. And then the first day of class, he wrote what he could in a letter to his English teacher. And you know, I, you know the schools up here, normally that kid couldn't make it. But um, we wrapped our heads around the kid. He spent the summer up here um, working facilities. And I, my wife and I and the former head of school would drive him 45 minutes one way every day to the special school for kids who had learning disabilities and stuff like that. And he has a master's degree now. Mm. Um, that's the biggest win. Nothing new. And he was a great basketball player. When he got here, he got injured. He got injured in college and was a good player, just okay player. But but he persevered through that and embraced the academic component and he has a master's degree. Oh, that's a great story right there. How about the best player you've ever coached against? Mike Any Beasley. level. Let's do prep school, then college level. Uh, prep school, Mike Beasley. Mm. No question about it. Um, he could turn it off. He could turn it on. And even off was on for everybody else. Uh, Mike Beasley, was, he, was, he was incredible. I would say Kevin Durant became that, but when I played against him, when I was at West Nottingham, he was an eighth grader. And it's a funny story. Um, his dad could tell you, Wayne could tell you, that all of our guys on our team, that Josh was kind of laugh when he came in the game because he's really skinny, but he had gigantic feet. And I watched him go up and down the court a couple of times. I was like, after the game, I was like, guys, I don't want you laughing at that. That's a pro. That's what a pro looks like. And then a couple of players were like, are you sure? I was like, I'm just telling you, that's what a pro looks like. Ended up being Kevin Durant. Um, but but in terms of getting got stuff done, probably Mike Beasley. Um, the college level, I say there weren't a lot of them on our team at Washington. Um, you know, we had a lot of we had a lot of pros, and obviously Isaiah Thomas was great, and Terrence Ross and guys like that. Um, trying to think, but UCLA in those days and Arizona, all those teams in the Pac-12 were chock full of pros. So it's hard it's it's hard to say. We played in went to Maui, 
Um, Draymond Green was off the charts, like lottery pick in your brain, but he's just like he is in the NBA. On that Michigan State team we played against, he was getting a heck of a lot done on that court. You know, and Kentucky was loaded when we played them in Maui. Virginia had really good players. It's just, there's so many good players in college basketball. It's just hard to pick one. Gotcha. What are your hobbies when you're not coaching? Uh, I love to fish and read. Fish um, and read. Yeah. Um, my wife used to laugh at me because when we were at University of Washington, I actually drove with a fishing rod in the back of my car. <laughs> and I really don't sleep that much. So I get up like 4.35 in the morning on the way to the office, throw my line into a lake, see if I can catch something and go to work. Same thing on the way home. You know, here we have a lake and a pond here on campus, and you can catch me every time I get a chance. I just throw, throw the line in. If not, I'm a voracious reader. You can see right now, so my, I have three books that just came in yesterday, and I'll, these, these will be done by the, by the end of the week. Hold them up. Let me see what you got there. Um, Stick Together by John Gordon. Yo, John Gordon. Gordon yeah, John Gordon. So this is John Gordon's week. Um, I do that, and I, I tell all the players, like, and I – because a lot of college coaches, when they hear me say read all the time, they're like, when do you have time to do that? I'm like, well, when you're recruiting, don't you fly places? Are you sleeping? When you get places, are you going out at night, hanging out? Or, or are you trying to sharpen your saw? You know, I really believe, especially even during the season, is it going to be a time every day I shut my office door for 15 to 20 minutes and read something that has nothing to do with basketball. Mm. And I really believe the sharper the mind, the better you're able to think. And I tell players all the time, if you can't think, you can't play. You know, and the same thing for me. If I can't think, I can't coach. I can't be of assistance to someone. I'm offering anecdotal information to people rather than sometimes they need objective information. So um, those are my those are my two things. Yeah, I'd say one of the best purchases I've ever made in my life, which I really just held off for the longest time as a Kindle. And now I've got like six books, different subjects. I just bounce around firing the brain off on just different topics. When I talk to people, I actually get books because I'm, I'm a kinesthetic learner. I got to touch and feel it, mm -hmm. pages back, write in it, all that type of stuff. So I tried the Kindle, but that just wasn't for me. But any, to me, anything, anything that helps someone read, you know, and I'll tell you the, the main reason why I became a voracious reader. So my grandmother only went to third grade. She wasn't a slave or anything, but her family grew up on sharecroppers farm. And she said to me one day, I was complaining about reading in middle school, um, probably like sixth grade. And um, she said, uh, oh yeah? She said, do you know in, uh, during, during slavery times that uh, you know where the slave owners kept their, kept their money? They hid their money? And I was like, no, she said books. I said, books? She said, yeah, because slaves weren't allowed to read. And so they knew their money was safe. And that just, boom. Clicked it. And then I then I actually helped her uh, learn how to read. Oh, that's um, great. So yeah, that's my thing about reading. Plus, I mean, it just, I, I, I would read all, I mean, like I said, I'm going on a flight, or I didn't say this, but I'm going on a flight next Sunday. It's going to be two connections and it's by myself without my family. I have magazines saved up. I've got bookmarks saved in my computer. I've got my Kindle, Red Rock, and I can't wait to get to the airport early and spend seven to eight hours straight. Absolutely. It's the best. And, and I got, I got a little uh, word doc I keep where I just cut out uh, cut and paste quotes nonstop. And then I print those up every six months and every morning I read a page just to yeah, kind of refresh what's going on. Push you do. And I do say I'm a quote person, but I, I generate all the posts you see I put. Um, those are just, those are quotes for me, but I do acknowledge other people when I see great quotes and something I do with our guys here. We have a group chat every morning. I'm sending them something. I'm sending our players something to think about something to think about. I think it's really important to, again, if you can't think, you can't play. And there's probably some books and quotes too you've read that have changed your life. No question about Give it. it. I mean, Do you have one off the top of your head right now? So, so many. Um, uh, you know what? Actually, a person, Coach, Coach George Rabbit, when I worked for him, um, he, would, he, would, he would have like these mm. quotes and he'd be like, man, they were challenging. It's just so many of them. Um, but the one, the, 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 quote, the quote I kind of... Uh, live my coaching thing by and came from my college coaches always leave it better than you found it yeah. you know leave it better than you found it and back in the day we found out what he meant we we played at Penn at the palestra and we walked into a locker room played the game there literally was a piece of paper about this big on the floor and I don't think any of us even knowledge and saw it when we went there and at the end of the game none of us had picked it up we got back the next day of practice he ran us so hard I'm like what he goes there was a piece of paper on the floor in that locker room, you guys didn't pick it up. You didn't leave it better than you found it. And so that's, that's kind of one. 
that's kind of one for us. Yeah, I remember I traveled once with George to, to Asia and he had just all those printouts of all the articles he was going to read and he was just oh. constantly taking notes and whatnot. And he's a voracious reader as well. So one of the smartest people I've ever been around. Yeah. The quote that stuck with me, I read about two years ago and, you know, I know you've got older kids and uh, I've got young ones right now, a three-year-old and a five month old. And the quote was, if I'm 85 years old, how much of my money would I spend to come back to this moment right now? Right. I exactly. give it all away. I give everything away to come back and hang out. So when I'm trying to think about, ah, you know, we're doing kids stuff or I got work to do. I try to remember that quote there and just bring me back in the present. Cause this time I mean, you got older, older daughter now, like that it flies by. So well, that's part of my daughter, she's going to turn 14 next month. And she, her quote, her quote, she knows, um, uh, no blood, no band-aid. She'll sit there the rest of her life. That was our, that was our quote when she fell down. Cause you know, when kids fall down when they're little parents rush over, they weren't going to cry. And parents, Oh, you okay. And the kids start crying. And so when she was little, our saying was no blood, no bandaid. So and it's, it's the toughness thing in our family. And when she does stuff, she plays sports or whatever. If there's no blood, there's no bandaid. She knows that there's no, nothing, we're not going to whine. Yeah. My daughter loves playing with band-aids. So there's so many, uh, uh, phantom ailments that get a band-aid put on them because they're princess band-aids. Right. So I, I don't know if I could work that one, <laughs> but, uh, but that's a great one. All right. Last question here. What is your favorite movie of all time? Um, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Jack oh, yeah. it actually got me into psychology. Um, I it was like Danny DeVito's in there, Christopher Lloyd, there's all these people, Scatman, Crothers. You don't recognize it when you first are watching it, but it was just such a, um, I'm a people watcher. You know, you grew up near the city, you, you, you become a people watcher. And that movie right there absolutely got me drawn towards psychology. Uh, my favorite movie. Yeah, that's a great one. Well, Chill, thanks so much for coming on. It was great catching up with you. I think you shared a lot of great wisdom today that uh, we'll all gather something from and uh, just good luck with the future. And I'm looking forward to, Finally, uh, working with you on a player here in the near future, and I'm glad you're a friend. Absolutely. I appreciate it, Corey. Keep doing right. what you're doing. Thanks, man. Okay, this is uh, the Prep Athletics Podcast with uh, Coach Rafael Chilius of South Kent School in Connecticut. And uh, please feel free to subscribe to me on YouTube or any podcast uh, platform there is, and we'll see you next episode.